So my name is Joan Fontanals and here is my colleague Johannes and we are here to present you how you can use Gina to bring your neural search and multimodal machine learning applications to the cloud and how we can help you with that. First, let me share uh, some words about Gina and how, who we are. So we are an open source company that was founded in 2020, so in the middle of the pandemic, and that influenced a lot the way we work. So we are distributed around the globe. We have more than 50 team members right now, and we have four main offices, two in China, one in, in Berlin, and one new one in the US. We have raised $38 million in funding, and we are consist considered as a top tier AI company in the world by some publications. So what we do, we are developing an ecosystem of projects and products, open source based, around this neural search and multimodal world. So don't worry because we're not gonna take a look at all of these. We are gonna focus on Docker Ray and Gina that form our MLOps framework to, to develop these applications. So we have, been this, uh, we have been talking about this neural search and multimodal ML. And first I would like to make sure that we all understand what neural search is. So in, in an easy way to, to, to describe this, um, neural search is deep learning powered information retrieval. So in opposition to the traditional search where, where, uh, where search is done by comparing keywords and tokens, neural search is about transforming documents that can be text or whatever into a, an embedding vector that we expect to have semantic content and do um, nearest neighbors are, um, with that. So we expect that um, relevant documents that are relevant between each other, they are together in this embedding space. This is the simplest way to explain it. And with this, we can do um, find sentences in a book, for instance, or we can go and since we are transforming two, two vectors, we can do this with images, for instance, or and you can build kind of a e-commerce shop applications with this principle. But you can go beyond that. You can go to audio, video, or whatever. But the the quality of the results that you will get is limited by the well limited or provided by the capacity of these models to capture the world, and this is provided by the community and the research, and and the capacity to learn these to to learn these concepts, these semantic concepts, is being increased right now because the the community is trying to work with multimodal um, data. So the capacity to understand the, the world is increased if we use, for instance, the captions that come with images, the audios linked to the to videos and so on. So we understand from Gina that multimodal is the future of machine learning. So instead of staying in one modality or one type of data, we are trying now to build relationships and to understand the relationships with, within this type of data. And it's not only us who believe that. So all the big players in the tech industry and research labs have been in the last years developing models and applications in this direction. Okay. So when we see this world of building relationship within this data, we can see two patterns emerging. So we have neural search where data is found. When data is already there with more data you can find. So you can do text to image search audio to video search, whatever you can do, as long as you have a, a, a model that can extract this information. Or we have been seeing a raise in the last months and years about creative AI. So for instance, doing a painting from a textual prompt or whatever. And in Gina, for instance, we have Dali Flow, that is a product that is done using our tech stack that does this, that enables to do this. For instance, you can create, given a prompt, you can create images such as this. And well, this is, you can play it with that, it's very fun, and you can have a lot of really good results. So we have defined more or less which, in which context and field we, uh, we work on. But then, why are we here? Because Gina is, a, is here to help you solve some problem. So here, I want to, un to, to describe what problems we have seen in, from Gina so that we can try to solve it with, with our te tech stack. So, First, let's look at a typical workflow from a, for a machine learning engineer when developing an application. So first, you would, maybe it's an oversimplification, but we can agree on, the, on these steps. We have to train the model, create a POC, it will work locally, you will share with your colleagues, it will not scale or anything, but you will prove that you can provide value to some users. No? 
then you need to wrap this model into an API and make it accessible from the outside. You have to do the data validation. You need to containerize and deploy into the cloud. All this is a long journey and it makes it even harder if you are working with multimodal data because you have to deal with more, much more things. So the challenges appear. For instance, the tech stack blows up. You have to deal with images, with text. You have different libraries, different applications, different things to deal. So you have to turn it into an API. They might collide. They might have problems with each other. This is something that we will see how we can ease with the use of Gina. Then bringing all these applications to productions in its own, it has a lot of, of problems on its own that all, on its own it's already a, a, a nightmare. So all combined, it's really problematic. You have to provision the hardware, serving, enable the monitoring to understand the, the, how the, the application is used. You have to handle the networking, scale, make it all robust. And this, this journey, since it's so long, it involves many people with different skills. And from Gina, what we want to do is to empower the machine learning engineer to focus on what they are good in, the, in their business logic and in their machine learning knowledge. And we are going to see, and here Johannes, my colleague, is going to show you how we can try to ease and solve these problems using Gina. Hi. Okay, it's working now. Um, thank you, John. So now that we know what the problem is and what we're trying to solve, let's take a look at how we do solve it using Gina AI and the tech stack that we have developed. And specifically, we will be looking at three parts of our ecosystem. So the first part is Docker Ray. It's an open source Python library, which will help you to unify your tech stack and handle data of all kinds of different modalities. So as John said, videos, audio, text, whatever you want, you can all handle this with Docker Ray. Then the next part of the puzzle is Gina. And Gina is our MLOps framework for multimodal data and normal search. And this will help you then, once you have developed your proof of concept, to lift it into the cloud and make it production ready and serve it to your users. And then the last step, which we will touch upon very briefly today, is uh, jcloud. So this is our cloud service, which we can then use to actually run your Gina app. Um, so we can just give us your Gina app, we run it for you and expose it to the outside world. And with this in place, then the new workflow of a machine learning engineer will be quite a bit simpler. So it will be like this. So you first develop your, um, you create a model, you develop your proof of concept. You will still use your, uh, your, um, your PyTorch or your TensorFlow uh, or whatever you want. But to handle your data, you will use Docker Ray. Right? So this is the first step. Then in the next step, you will just do a simple refactoring of your code using Gina and you will get microservices, scaling and deployability all for free with a simple refactor in the Gina framework. And lastly, you can deploy it, as I said, with just one line on jcloud. So as we can see from here already, it's a much simpler um, uh, process to get from proof of concept to deployment. So the first thing that we'll be taking a look at is Docker Ray. As I said, our uh, data structure for unstructured data of all kinds of different realities. And yeah, it's, it's fully open source. You can check out the GitHub. Um, and what it does is it gets you from your starting point where you just have an idea, you just want to play around with things. This is sort of the data science phase, let's call it. You maybe train your model or you have a pre-trained model and you get just from your idea to your proof of concept. And the way we do it, one important thing that we do to make this very easy um, when you deal with multimodal data is we provide a unified interface for all kinds of data. So no matter the text, the, the data modality that you have, you will only have to worry about one interface and this interface being uh, Docker Ray. So one API that we have is this data class API. And as you can see here, you can very easily create, create um, a data class um, that where you can define the structure of your data, right? So in your domain, in your business problem, you have a different uh, structure of your data. You have images that have some relation to text, some relation to audio, etc. You can very easily model this here. And then once you're done, you can convert your data class uh, to a document. Um, another thing you can do is, as John mentioned in the beginning, very easily build a search solution, a search proof of concept. And here we can see how easy this can be done in just 18 lines of code. And at the end, we'll also showcase some other features with this code snippet. So let's maybe step through some, some steps in this, in this code snippet to understand how simple it can be to build a search application with Docker Ray. 
So the first thing we need to do is to load our data, right? So in this case, this is just text. This is some corpus that we get from the web. And as we can see, we can just very simply pass a URI to, document, to a document and then call this load URI to text, helper function, helper method, and then a document array will go to this address. Web address will grab the text, will load it into the text attribute of the document. Um, next, we can um, strip our data apart so we can sentencize it and split every sentence into one discrete part in our um, in our data handling and then we wrap all of this up in a document array right so first we had a document which held, holds all the text data now we have a document array an array of documents and each document holds one sentence of our text next we can do embedding which is the process that Joanne explained in the beginning so we take each sentence and pass it through a model and create this vector representation of this of this text or of this sentence. These vectors can then be compared to do the actual search. Next we can create a query. So we want to search for something. What do we want to search for? Well we can for example search for the phrase she smiled too much. Then in the end we will search through our entire text corpus for this sentence or sentences that are semantically similar to this. And here is where the actual searching happens. So Array um, provides this method, .match, where you can um, use your query, use your corpus that you have tokenized, sentenced, and embedded before, and then you can do searching in just one line. Um, some other features that Docarray uh, ships with out of the box is uh, storing to disk, and we have uh, multiple different options here. So we have deep integration with different vector database backends. So once you have your embedding vector representations, you can store those on disk and do a very efficient approximate nearest neighbor search between those different vectors on disk. And we have a range of options that you can choose from freely, Redis, Elasticsearch, SQLite, we 8 Qdrand, and also our in-house uh, solution called Inlight. Uh, and another very important aspect of Docker A is that it's ready to be uh, ready to wire, or it's made for data in transit. This will obviously become very important later when we will talk about microservices, right? We need to send all of this data uh, from one machine to the other over the network. So we also offer a range of serialization options like protobuf, JSON, to pandas data frame, just binary, base64, two pedantic model, etc. Um, so that you can very easily send your data and you don't need to worry about that either. So if we run all of this, then this is what we get, right? Our query was, she smiled too much, and we can say, see the output, that the, the results that we get, but she smiled too much, a uh, little, she might have fancied, etc., etc. And at the end, the numbers that we see are the similarity scores that we get. And of course, you can uh, customize, personalize every aspect of this. You can do, use different similarity metrics, etc. Use your own machine learning models to perform this search. But this is the basic workflow that you would use with Docker Ray to create such a search. So we have now seen how you can use Docker Ray to locally on your laptop build a very simple but impressive proof of concept or like data science kind of solution. Uh, and the next step now, and this will be the bulk of this talk, is about Gina. Like how you take what we have just seen, what we have just created, how, you, how do you take this and lift this to the cloud. Um, as I said, Gina is our MLOps framework for this kind of thing. It's also fully open source. You can also check this one out. And this is what it does. It goes from your laptop to the cloud. So we've seen the first step, you go from your idea, proof of concept, then you go vertical, do the scaling. And we basically incorporate all of these uh, technologies that you see here that you would usually have to worry about. We do it all for you. Um, and when I say production ready, what do I actually mean? What will it give you? Well, it gives you a bunch of stuff, right? It gives you replicas and sharding and scalability. So if you have a certain component, you want to make it robust. So if it goes down, you have replicas that can kick in and keep serving the requests, or you can scale it up for more uh, requests at the same time, etc. We have streaming, um, we have async, non-blocking execution. We have a, run a range of different protocols that you can communicate with the data. So we'll, this will spawn a server, and then you can connect to the server using gRPC, WebSocket, HTTP, GraphQL, uh, whatever you want. We basically under the hood launch an entire microservice um, architecture for you, all containerized in Docker. We have uh, observability support baked in, so you can use Prometheus and Grafana to see what's going on. We have a hub plugin ecosystem. You can take pre-built building blocks that the community has built and use it in your application. And lastly, we have seamless integration with Kubernetes. So if you really want to be serious about your deployment, you want scalability and all the automatic stuff that comes with Kubernetes, you can very easily do it with Gina. And to, um, to make it so simple and to 
like, take all this hard work out of your hands, we have to work with a number of different layers of abstraction. We even have <laughs> a very fancy animation here. <laughs> Super cool. Uh, so these are the different layers of abstraction that you usually have to deal with when you uh, build such an application. Um, but with Gina, you really only have to worry about and interact with three different things, three concepts. So this is flow, executor, and document. Let me now explain what these are. So document, this is inherited from the document array package. This is the basic data structure. And as we will see, everything in Gina is based on this document. This is a sort of contract that needs to be followed, which makes everything else much easier and will ultimately make your life easier as a user of this framework. The next thing is the executor. And the executor um, is a group of functions, a one, yeah, w one um, computation that you define. And you can define this as whatever you want, but you think, can think of it as one um, unit of operation, one computation. And very importantly, as I said, this will take documents as input and spit out documents at the end again. And uh, later we'll see that one executor will then become one microservice in your microservice architecture. Uh, and lastly, we have the flow, and the flow simply takes executors and ties them together in a sort of pipeline. So you can define how your executors should be tied together, what information goes into what executor and then uh, into what other executor next. You can create this entire flow that combines them. And this can basically be any di the directed acyclic graph. You're really free to choose how your information should flow through, through this flow. And with these concepts, um, in mind, we can now look at another basic example that shows us how with Gina then you can bring the example that we've seen before, this easy text search to the cloud with a simple refactoring, right? So this is all the code that you need to create an embedding service for text um, fully, fully in the cloud. Yeah, that's a microservice. So the first thing we do is we create our first executor. This is done here. So we just um, take this executor base class that the Gina package provides and we inherit from it. Uh, and then we create this sentencizer. And the sentencizer does the first step that we have seen before. So it takes all the text and splits it into different sentences that then we can search through. So we have one function, uh, sen, I, I call it, um, which takes, as you can see, docs, which is a document array. And then we operate on it. We do the same operations that we did before. We just strip the text into different sentences and then we return a document array again. So this is the first microservice, the first executor that we built, our first unit of computation. Then we can build another unit of computation, our second, uh, second executor. This will be our encoder. And this will then take the sentences from the first executor and encode them. So create these vector embeddings for each sentence, these vector embeddings that can then be used to search sem semantically similar sentences in our database. Then we have the flow. Right? As we said, this ties the executors together, so we instantiate a flow object. And here it is very simple. It's just a chain. Uh, so we first add the tokenizer, then Oh, this should be synthesizer, small typo. And then we uh, add our encoder. So we just take one and then the other and the data will flow through this. But as I said before, you can kind of have all kinds of branchings and parallel branches and then merge stuff together. This is really free for you to choose whatever is necessary in, 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 your, in your domain for, for your app. Then we can again uh, define a query and send it to this flow. And now this is different from before. Before we just it was just Python code running, but now this will create when we launch the flow with this with statement. This will create a whole microservice architecture and the server that you can connect to as with one of the protocols that I've mentioned, so gRPC, HTTP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we can post a message to the server and it will do uh, the computation that we've defined and return the results. Right. Um, so. We can look at this in action. So we launch our script. And as you can see, it takes a little bit to spin up the server. Now it's ready. We send the data. And lastly, we get the results with the, with the complete embeddings. Look at it again. So all of these executors spinning up, the server spinning up. We can connect to it, send data, get the results. And all it took for us to achieve this was this simple refactoring that you've just seen. But now let's take a look at what actually happens under the hood when you execute these lines of code. And what you see here is a graphical depiction of the architecture that we spawn for you when, you when you do this kind of thing. So what you can see here, we have two different deployments, we call them, one for each executor, right? And um, so at the top, you can see that we have three replicas of a certain uh, executor. So you can, for each executor, decide how many replicas you want to have. So you have robustness and reliability. If one of them goes down, the other one can take over and you can keep serving, or if you have uh, an increase in, in requests coming in, you can add more replicas and make everything more reliable and robust. And the other thing is this gateway in front. And the gateway basically does the 
connection between the executor. So this gateway will take in requests and then decide or like choose where to send it to. So the, the logic that you've defined in the flow will then be handled by this gateway and this coordinates between the executors. And the first thing I would like to look at in even more detail is, the, is this gateway and how it does this connecting of the executors. So the gateway can be thought of as sort of split into two halves. One half is the one that you as a user connect to with your clients and your data. And the other half is the flow side. So the, the other half is the, uh, the side that yeah, communicates with the microservices, with the executors. So on the left, as I said, you have different uh, options to connect to this gateway. You have either gRPC or you can use uh, HTTP powered by FastAPI, GraphQL powered by uh, Strawberry, or WebSocket also powered by FastAPI. So on this side, we don't reinvent the wheel. We just take these great open source um, projects and, and use them in our gateway. On the other side, however, um, this is the one that we will look at more deeply we have our logic that handles this communication between the executors. So we have a streamer, um, we have a topology graph and a connection pool. These are the sort of three concepts that under the hood do a lot of the networking for us. So if we think about what needs to happen whenever a request comes into the system, it's basically three things that need to happen for every request. First, there's a topology graph, because as we said, in the flow, a user can really define any directed ASIC leaf graph that defines how the information flows through the architecture. So the topology graph in the, in the gateway is there to dictate the routing between different executors, between different nodes in this graph. But it's only on the logical level, so to speak. So like it really only has a graph representation and it does the routing between the graphs. The next thing is the connection pool. And the connection pool maps every logical node in this graph to an actual physical hardware networking address so we can really send stuff around. Lastly, the streamer is the thing that does the actual sending over the network based on the information it gets from the topology graph and the connection pool. So to dig in a little bit more how this works, let's look at the topology graph. So here we have a very simple example of a simple flow, a simple graph that is just three nodes connected one after the other. So if you have a flow and add an executor, add another one, add another one without any special um, requirements, then you will just have three nodes uh, like, like like on a string essentially and as we said each node each executor represents one unit of computation and in python we have a very nice way of modeling this which is through tasks async io tasks so what happens is that each node in this graph will be associated by one task and the way we route between these nodes is that we recursively traverse the graph structure and basically every node we ask a node, what is your task? And internally, it will ask the next node in the graph, what is your task? And then so forth and so forth until we reach the end of our graph representation. So we have this uh, recursive chain of tasks that sort of contain each other, so, right? The, the cause going one way and then the task chain goes in the other way. Then the last task in this graph, so this is the end, this is the leaf. This is what we actually execute then in the streamer, what we await. So this is the computation that will be triggered and then internally it has all the other computations, all the other tasks, which will then be recursively called again. This is, this is how the topology graph figures out this routing. Okay, so now we know how the information is supposed to logically flow through the graph. But the next question is, how do we actually find this unit computa of, of computation, so to speak? How do I find these microservices in my network? And this is what the connection pool does. So it maps from a logical node to a networking address. But it's not so simple, right? Because we have seen that we can have different replicas for each uh, executor. So every logical node actually is associated with multiple um, multiple executors in hardware, multiple networking address. So we need to do load balancing between those nodes. So the connection pool needs to decide what address do I actually choose from, right? Here's different options, different replicas. What do I pick? Um, there's also some infrastructure that needs to be handled for gRPC to work, this networking protocol, so stops and channels, and we need the ability to add and remove connections sort of dynamically on the fly. And all of this is done by the connection pool. Lastly, the request streamer takes the information that it gets from the two other things and does the actual sending over the wire. And here we can basically see how this works. So as we've said, the last task is the one that we actually um, uh, wait for or execute first. So this would be task four here, right? So we send our request once it comes in to the first or last executor associated with the last task. And then we send it and receive it again from the streamer. And then recursively, we go through the entire chain and then we um, can execute all of the units of computation along our graph as we figured it out. 
And here we can also see why um, we need, this needs to be a very asynchronous system, right? You have these async IO tasks, right? Why does it need to be asynchronous? This we can see here. So if you have a document which is in transit from the request streamer to one executor, or maybe another document also in transit, and then we have a new request coming in, a new document coming in, then the request streamer should obviously not be blocked. It should, in an asynchronous manner, be able to handle with this new request coming in. This is where async IO is basically perfect. We don't need to spawn new uh, processes or threads. This is entirely unnecessary because the latency will actually come from network, from IO. So this is why we have everything as async IO tasks. Okay, so this is how the gateway works. We, we've made it. That, that's how it's done under the hood. Um, and so the next thing we can look at is on the executor side, how it's done. So we can zoom into this deployment and, and see what it does. So as, we, as we've said, each deployment can have for the same executor, multiple replicas of the same um, executor. And then it, the, what this actually is depends on how you run your flow, where you run your system. So we highly advise people to run it in Kubernetes if they are serious about production, and then our deployment will just be a Kubernetes deployment. And Kubernetes will take over the management of the life cycle of these replicas and do all that uh, stuff for us. But if you run your Gina flow for prototyping, etc., on your laptop, then it will be it will be a Gina deployment, and it will just do very simple load balancing between these different uh, replicas. Nothing fancy. Um, yes. So. Then we can zoom in one last time to understand how these, a single executor actually works um, as a microservice. Because as, as we've seen, as a user, you really only write Python code. But as, for this to work as a microservice, it can't just be Python code. It needs to have networking, uh, etc. And how does this work? So essentially, we built a runtime around these, uh, these executors that will handle a bunch of the uh, I.O. for us. So when a request comes in, it's just, yeah, it's a request, a network request that comes over the wire. So it goes into a runtime, and the job of the runtime is then to unpack this request and extract a document array. Because as we've said, document array is our fundamental data structure that everything runs on. Right? Then we can pass this document array into the executor. And this then just some, does some computation that the user has defined, whatever it may be. The only important thing is that it returns a document array again. Then we pipe this into the runtime again. It does the inverse conversion. It wraps it up into response, and we can send it off via gRPC again. This, as I said, will all be handled for you, and all you need to do as a user is write a clean Python code, and the rest is abstracted away. So now that the uh, response has been created as a networking response, we can send it back to the gateway from the executor, and the gateway can then do its management with the streamer, etc., and send it on to the next executor. Okay. Now we've seen how Gina helps you to build a microservice architecture for scalability, robustness, and cloud readiness as a simple refactor in Python. And the last thing I would like to mention briefly is, is jCloud, our hosted solution for these flows once you've created them. So um, we've seen that Gina sort of brings you from local to the cloud, but what you can do instead of just going to any cloud, you can go specifically uh, to jCloud. And at this point, let me emphasize again that you don't need to use Gina Cloud, right? Gina and Docker is fully open source. You're free to deploy it on-premise or on any cloud provider that you want. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. But you will have to do some additional work uh, to get it to really be ready. So you will have to provision your own resources, of course. We cannot give you your machine. If you run it on your own machine, you will probably want to set up a Kubernetes uh, instance. You will want to enable monitoring. So you have to spawn uh, Grafana and Prometheus. You will probably want to put in a proper API gateway like Kong, etc., issue certificates, um, all that sort of stuff. And finally, then, yeah, actually deploy the flow and see that it's running and, and check that it's up and all that sort of stuff. Or alternatively, you can do one line of code. You can do gina cloud deploy flow.yammer. So you can define your flow in the YAML file, um, give it to us, and we will basically manage everything that you see on the left here. We'll manage all of these parts for you, and your flow, flow will be deployed, deployed on jcloud. OK, I think, I think we've made it. I uh, hope it was interesting. So we, uh, to recap, what we've seen is how you can go from your idea and the proof of concept to it being production ready, being a microservice, and actually deploying it uh, on the cloud. That's all, uh, all we wanted to share with you today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you guys have any questions, remarks, then we're, we're happy to answer. Thank you.
Okay, no questions. Is that a very good or very bad? I'm not sure. <laughs> There's one question there, I think. No, I can come up with uh, uh, Yeah, well, yeah. So the question was what we offer to make f development of the model sort of the, the proof of concept stage, I think, how to make that faster and easier. I think the main thing that is offered through Docker Ray is just native handling of all kinds of different data. Um, so you, because that's really our focus, right? This multi-model data, as you've seen, we have these convenience functions for text data to load it from the web, load it this into text. We have similar stuff for video, for audio, for images, etc. Uh, I think this is our main value proposition here, but like we don't try to replace PyTorch or TensorFlow, et cetera. So on the like actual def building your model and training it, this is this is not really our scope. Anything to add? Well, yeah, not we. It was not in the scope of this presentation, but we also have another open source project that is called our Fine Tuner, that it's gonna help you to fine tune your models to your own data. But we didn't cover here, but it's also an open source project of Gina that you can check in our. GitHub profile. Um, yeah, well, the question was if uh, there is versioning for executors and if you can roll back to an old one if it starts failing. So there is versioning in our Gina hub where we said about this hub of executors, you can version and tag them. And for the rolling back um, it's in the deployment phase where you should co cover it. It's not in our um, it's not in our Gina open source covered, but in the cloud, if you have a deployment that is not working, you can always roll back with this versioning. Yeah. Okay. So is it it is possible because it's everything is containerized but we don't have a, a helper me method to make it easy so we have a helper method to map gene applications to kubernetes yamls to docker and um, com compose but docker swarm we didn't cover but it should be some work but it could be so at the end it's only containerized executors connect connecting connected to each other And if they are willing to contribute that to the to the project, <laughs> we would be more than than happy to have them. So the question was, how is our experience with in onboarding data scientists to the project? So at the beginning, we had a big problem to onboard people from only data science background. That's where our split came and we separated Docker Ray so that we, it was an easy first point of touch. And I think since then, we have seen more people with no backend engineering background deploying and working with Gina and having um, nice applications being built. I think the key was when Docker Ray was integrated in Gina at the beginning, when we split and make it an independent project that you don't, that you can install independently and play with it locally and make it easier. That was the b best point to, for them to have the first the first touch and the first feeling of how what power we can give. Maybe one thing to add here, like if you don't want to lean into Docker Ray too much, in theory you can just stick to your workflow, do everything in NumPy or PyTorch or whatever you want, and then have your tensor at the end and put it into Docker Ray and send it off to Gina. Of course, we don't encourage you to do it, but if it, if, a, if a data scientist really doesn't want to change their workflow, there's nothing that's in the way 
um, with our way of working. So the question was about the benefits of displaying a tensor and how we manage mime types be uh, behind the scenes. The second part of the question, I, I, I'm not sure, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> really in the, for how it manages, the exp I think I recall the question that was more or less referred in the previous talk. It's right now, I don't have the details in mind. I don't know every line of code, but I think so I'm not sure if we have a priority of which kind of URI we access. I think it should be in the documentation. If we, it's not found in the documentation, it's our fault and we would try to improve. So feel free to go and, uh, and ask in an issue. <laughs> So that's it. Thank you very much for staying. Thank you. Thank you.